Hello, my name is Michael Breidenbach, and I'm Chair and Associate Professor of History at Ave Maria University. I'd like to thank the organizers of this conference, especially Professor Lechia Castaldi, and I'm grateful to you for the opportunity to speak on how film can illuminate some of the themes of this conference. In 1995, a few months before his famous address to the United Nations, Pope John Paul II spoke to the Pontifical Commission for Social Communications on the centenary of the first motion picture. The film industry, he said, has become a universal medium exercising a profound influence on the development of people's attitudes and choices and possessing a remarkable ability to influence public opinion and culture across social and political frontiers. He continued, film is capable of dealing in depth with subjects of great meaning and importance from an ethical and spiritual point of view. In this spirit, I'd like to analyze two films that illustrate what the Pope called a century of violent coercion and a century of persuasion. The first film is Alfred Hitchcock's Rope, and the second is Gabriel Axel's Babette's Feast. Both films present allegories of dinner parties. In Rope, two young men murder their friend, and in the same night and in the same room, they host a dinner party with the family, friends, and fiancé of the victim. In Babette's Feast, a renowned French chef flees the violent streets of Paris, humbles herself to cook for two spinster sisters for no pay, later wins the lottery, and with her winnings, lavishes on the sisters and their puritanical friends a once-in-a-lifetime feast. Hitchcock's film, released just after World War II, is a chilling depiction of Nietzschean ethics and the experience of dehumanization in the 20th century. Babette's Feast, on the other hand, features a very different dinner party. It is an allegory of the Last Supper, and it artfully presents a century of persuasion, once built, one built, on what the Pope calls the civilization of love. Alfred Hitchcock's 1948 film, Rope, begins with a murder. Unlike many suspense films, Rope shows the actual murder and the murderers. Brandon Shaw and Philip Morgan. They are two men dressed in suits and ties, preparing a fancy dinner, a fancy dinner replete with champagne in a Manhattan penthouse. And they have just strangled to death their friend, David Kentley, with a rope in broad daylight. We feel the suspense because we saw the murder, but the dinner party guests have not. This dramatic irony is heightened by the fact that Brandon has orchestrated the dinner party ostensibly to show David's father some first edition books, but in reality, Brandon hosts the dinner to see whether David's family and friends will discover his dead body. David was a Harvard undergraduate and soon to be engaged to a New York socialite. Brandon describes David as the perfect victim for the perfect murder, an immaculate murder. He adds. Now, David's name is not incidental. It is, I think, a reference to King David, and from David's line came Christ. Hitchcock, who was a practicing Catholic, makes the religious theme clear when Brandon and Philip place the lifeless David in a large chest in the middle of the living room. They drape a cloth on the table, and they place three burning candles on each side of the table-turned tomb. In other words, Brandon, with the help of his altar boy, Philip, has arranged a mock altar. When Brandon places the candles on the altar, reminiscent of a Catholic high mass, Philip, Philip explains, what the devil are you doing? A pretty revealing choice of words. This act by Brandon is sacrilege, even satanic. When Mrs. Wilson, the housekeeper, arrives to prepare the dinner party, she finds the placement of candlesticks peculiar. Brandon replies that the candles make up a ceremonial altar for our sacrificial feast. 
and indeed this feast is a bloodless sacrifice. David, after all, has been strangled to death by a rope. There is no blood spilled in his death. David is also an only child, and because his mother is never shown in the film, his primary, primary relationship appears to be with his father. Brandon and Philip's murder, therefore, is an act against God in two ways. First, it's an act against the natural law. They have killed an innocent man. And second, as the mock altar symbolizes, it's an act akin to killing Christ in a sacrilegious Eucharistic feast. As Nietzsche famously wrote, God is dead and we have killed him. Indeed, Brandon is the apotheosis of Nietzschean ethics. A central idea of Nietzsche's thought is the will to power. For Nietzsche, the good is whatever augments the feeling of power, the will to power, power itself. And evil is whatever springs from weakness. The Übermensch, the Superman, accomplishes this will to power and contempt for humanity by making himself superior to humanity in power, in loftiness of soul, in contempt. According to Nietzsche, the Superman should help the weak die, for that would be an act of charity. This ethic, as Nietzsche well knew, is the antithesis of Christianity. Those who practice it are, as Nietzsche, Nietzsche's title suggest, suggests, the Antichrist. By way of context, I, I should note that Rope was based on a play, which was in turn based on a real-life murder case in 1924, the case involved two wealthy students from the University of Chicago, Nathan Leopold and Richard Loeb, who conspired to commit the what they called the perfect murder of a teenage boy whom they did not even know. They too admitted and invoked that they too admitted that they invoked Nietzsche to justify their crime. We see this thought unfold in the film. Before the guests arrive, Brandon tells Philip that being weak is a mistake. And Philip asks, because it's human? And Brandon replies, because it's ordinary. And that's David's crime. He's ordinary. During the party, Brandon tells David's father that the ones who can decide who is inferior and who is not are the few people who have such intellectual and cultural superiority that they're above traditional moral concepts. In an echo of Nietzsche, Brandon proclaims that good and evil, right and wrong, were invented for the ordinary average man, the inferior man, because he needs them. In his attempt to transcend ordinary morality, Brandon calls himself an artist and calls the mock altar his masterpiece. The power to kill, Brandon proclaims, can be just as satisfying as the power to create. This, of course, is an inversion of the natural law, even the metaphysical principle that being is greater than non-being. In Killing David, Brandon insists he's no common criminal. Common murderers kill for the sake of something else, money, revenge, and so on. But Brandon explains that he killed for the sake of killing, which in turn serves as evidence, he says, of his intellectual and cultural superiority. David's father in the play, the film, detects the Nietzschean overtones of Brandon and charges that Hitler had the same ethic. Brandon replies scornfully, Hitler was a paranoid savage. His supermen, all fascist supermen, were brainless murderers. Note here that Brandon does not say that Hitler was wrong. Instead, Brandon says he would hang all of these Nazis for being stupid. Brandon sees himself as accomplishing something greater than he thinks Hitler achieved, that is, the perfect murder. Brandon received this Nietzschean ethics at what he calls the master's feet, Rupert Cadell, his former housemaster and teacher. Rupert, played by Jimmy Stewart, is a World War II veteran and taught the boys that murder is good. At the dinner party, Rupert defends his belief in the presence of the incredulous and disgusted Mr. Kentley. Think of the problems it will solve, Rupert muses. Unemployment, poverty, 
standing in line for theater tickets. Rupert even publishes esoteric philosophy books promoting this ethic. If Rupert is the Nietzschean master, Brandon seeks to surpass his teacher by putting these ideas into practice. But as soon as Rupert discovers that Brandon and Philip have murdered David, Rupert has a change of heart. In the longest soliloquy in the film, Rupert tells Brandon, you've thrown my words right back in my face, Brandon. You've tried to twist them into a cold, logical excuse for your ugly murder. But there is always something deep inside me that will never let me do what you did. You've made me ashamed at every concept concept I ever had about inferior or superior beings. But I thank you for that shame because now I know that we are, each of us, a separate human being, Brandon, with the right to live and work and think as individuals, but with an obligation to the society we live in. By what right did you dare say that there's a superior few to which you belong? By what right did you dare say that that boy in there was inferior and therefore could be killed? Did you think you were God, Brandon? Ironically, these are the same questions that Mr. Kentley, David's father, had asked Rupert, Ru Rupert only a few minutes ago when Rupert so smugly justified the murder of inferior people. But Rupert seems to have a change of heart based on what he sees. If he lauded the idea of murder, but ignored its reality, he now fears both. And as T.S. Eliot powerfully writes in The Hollow Men, describing another mock religious service, what falls between the idea and the reality is the shadow, death. Rupert wishes to exonerate himself from that murder, but Hitchcock judges him guilty. When Rupert finally opens the chest to see the victim, he uses the hand stained with blood after an altercation with Philip. Rupert then shoots a gun outside the apartment to alert the police of the murder, and in the last frame of the film, Rupert st sits down the, beside the chest, full of fear, with his arm extended across the chest and with his hand grasping a gun. The point here extends beyond Rupert's particular guilt. It's ultimately about the source of this century of violent coercion. For the same rope used to strangle David is also used to tie Brandon's first edition books. The rope books lie quietly on the tomb, symbolizing the ideas that inspired the violence hidden underneath. In this world, there's no resurrection, no hope, only the fear of approaching sirens. Now Babette's Feast is also about a dinner party, but it's the inverse of the fear, coercion, and violence depicted in a rope. In this next film, we meet two sisters, Martine and Philippa, who live in a remote village in Denmark. Their father founded a pietistic sect of Protestantism that emphasizes austerity, strict piety, and celibacy. The film opens with a shot of dried fish, a symbol of Christianity, and one that might also symbolize their religion, one that can sustain life, but is itself somewhat lifeless and arid. We meet Martine and Philippa, named after Martin Luther and Philip Melanchthon, in old age, and then flash back to their youth when a strapping, if slightly undisciplined, cavalier officer called Lawrence and a winning baritone called Achille Papa attempt to woo the beautiful young sisters. Both sisters are foreigners and ill-suited for this religious sect. Lorenz, after all, is too worldly and free-spirited, and Achille is a Catholic, whom their father distrustingly calls a papist. Achille offers singing lessons to Filippo, who shows great promise, but as they sing Mozart's Don Giovanni, it's clear that the message of seduction in that opera is too much for this pietistic household. We then see the sisters in old age again. They are spinsters now who oversee a hardened, increasingly aged group of religious devotees 
who keep their father's quiet charism alive. One stormy, stormy evening, a woman named Babette arrives on their doorstep with a letter from Achil pleading for them to take Babette in as a housekeeper. She can cook, he writes in great understatement. Babette is traumatized after her flight from Paris, leaving behind her murdered husband and son killed in the suppression of the Paris Commune in 1871. In the first suggestion of her Christic character, it is Babette who chooses the sisters, not the sisters who choose Babette. They don't need a housekeeper, they cannot pay for her, but they agree for her to stay, and she serves them humbly for 14 years. One day, her fortunes dramatically change when she wins the lottery, leading to a windfall of 10,000 francs. The sisters expect Babette to use her winnings to repatriate to Paris and begin her life again, but instead she spends it all on an extravagant feast for them and their congregation. The occasion is all the more ironic because the feast will commemorate the 100th birthday of their religious founder, someone whom Babette does not follow and one who would assiduously avoid the opulent food that she will prepare. The sisters at first refuse Babette's grace. They never give their guests anything more than a modest supper, but she persuades them and they accept. As the ingredients arrive in the village, the sisters and other religious adherents fear that Babette's feast will be an occasion of sin. The procession of ingredients led by Babette, a large turtle, quail, a cow's head, and other exotic specimens shock the villagers. Martine's fear turns apocalyptic as she dreams of a wheezing turtle burning in hellfire and a chalice of, of, of wine filled with blood. Martine's fear prompts a meeting of the congregation in which they concede that they must attend the dinner but pledge not to talk about the food during the meal. They are willing to accept Babette's gift but remain closed to its full grace. The gray-haired congregation numbers 11, but Lawrence's return to the, that old village makes the dinner party 12. Lawrence, now a decorated general, disrupts their promise of silence and cannot contain his praise for the sumptuous dishes and choice wines before them. The worldly wise Lauren says that the meal reminds him of dining at the famous Café Anglais in Paris. One dish in particular reminds him of the chef, caille in sacophage, literally quail in a coffin. In this, Lauren's is like that disciple on the road to Emmaus who recognize Jesus in the breaking of the bread, that is, recognizing the identity of Christ by the way he presents his food. Babette's feast symbolizes the Last Supper. She gives of herself, her time, her talent, and her newly acquired fortune to the dinner guests, and they, and they number 12, paralleling the 12 apostles at the Last Supper. Lawrence, in this case, is like Matthias, who made the Twelve Apostles twelve again after Judas Iscariot's suicide. Her Christ-like generosity is also evinced when she gives the whole bottle of wine to Lawrence when he asks for just a little bit more, a subtle reference to the wedding feast at Cana. Besides Lawrence, who dons a colorful military uniform, all the dinner guests are dressed in black, the attire of austerity and mourning, this is a subtle reference, I think, to the death at the dinner party, not the murder in rope, but the death to self that Babette has just finished. And there's another death referenced during this dinner, the deaths of her husband and son in the 1871 repression of the Paris Commune. She has been mourning their loss and the loss of her life, former life in Paris for 14 years which, as one scholar has noted, is possibly a reference to the number of stations of the cross, given her suffering. In her sudden and dangerous flee from Paris, it's implied that she has not been, evil, been uh, able to even bury them. And so her signature dish, caille in sarcophage, the quail in a coffin, 
evokes the burial of her husband and son. Even the sauce of that dish looks like blood. And kai can also be used in French as a term of endearment for a loved one. When the sisters protest that Babette should not have spent all her lottery winnings on them, Babette admits that the dinner wasn't just for your sake. As one scholar has argued, it was also to put to rest her mourning, and her sacrifice is now complete. Babette reassures Philippa that although she doesn't have any more money, an artist, she says, is never poor. The contrasts between Babette and Brandon couldn't be starker. Both characters claim to be artists, yet one seeks to destroy and the other to create. Both are hosts of a feast, yet Brandon hosts the dinner party in order to boast of his supposed superiority, while Babette remains hidden from her guests throughout the whole dinner in quiet Christian humility. Both films deal with death, but rope concerns a death of an innocent man and the metaphorical death of God and his law, while Babette's feast concerns a death to self. Babette denies herself her fortune, forgoes fame to give a splendid dinner to those who cannot repay her in money or critical appreciation. Babette's butchering of the animals serves as a symbol for the sacrifice she herself engages in. The quail and coffin displays that sacrifice very clearly. While the Protestant congregants are scandalized by such a visceral reminder of flesh, perhaps echoing those who even left Jesus after hearing that they must eat flesh, it is the sacrifice of flesh that allows the dinner guests an occasion to reconcile and see true love. We also see the contrast in how each film begins the meal. At Brandon's dinner, no one says grace before the meal. But at Babette's feast, they all say grace, using the prayer of their religious founder. May the bread nourish my body. May my body do my soul's bidding. May my soul rise up to serve God eternally. Amen. But Babette's cooking is itself a prayer, one that neither treats bread in purely utilitarian terms nor seeks the total abnegation of the body, but instead sacramentalizes the food. As the general says, Babette transforms a dinner into a kind of love affair that made no distinction between bodily appetite and spiritual appetite. And perhaps the greatest contrast between these films is how the party ends. In Rope, the guests leave in great distress and fear of David's fate. The final guest, Rupert, discovers the murder and slumps next to the coffin as police sirens wail, neighbors shout, and red and green lights flash ominously into the apartment. In contrast, at Babette's feast, the solemn faces of each guest warms in the glow of candlelight and the ether of alcohol as they come to appreciate the gift of Babette's feast. They confess to each other, kiss, reconcile, and at the end of the night, hold hands, singing under twilight, dissolving the old wounds and resentments against one another. As promised, they don't talk about the food, but their faces say it all, the pleasure, the satisfaction, the joy. If rope shows what John Paul II called the fear which darkens human existence at the end of the 20th century, Babette's feast beautifully depicts what he calls an effort to build the civilization of love, founded on universal values of peace, solidarity, justice, and liberty. Babette's sacrifice shows the soul of the civilization of love. She offers her whole self to others in self-giving solidarity and stands as a witness to hope. Thank you.